are, darling. Four weddings. Here are Rocky Four. Five. Excuse me. Six. Excuse me. I bought this video from you last Saturday. So? Well, I can't understand a word. Train spotting. Not surprised. I'm talking to you, Scott. Yeah, ain't they? No. I mean, it's the, hey? it's the sound. Yeah. It's hopeless. Absolutely yeah. hopeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No trains in it either. I suppose that's my fault as well. Here are, darling. Four ninety nine. Well, the picture's rubbish as well. Well, that's your tracking, mate. It's all right on my other videos. Ooh. Tracking's touchy. Be careful. Most pirate videos are unwatchable, and there's no comeback. Got a receipt, eh? Got a receipt? Look, you said last week. You said it's no good, mate. Oral contract. Not worth the paper it's printed on. Here are, darling, four weddings. Train spotting. As advertised on Crime Stoppers. Pirate videos, daylight robbery. We are talking heads! Talking heads! Levels exceed the red! Metal heads! We're talking heads! Levels exceed the red! Pushing the mud to the edge! Heavyweight pressure coming down for the metal heads! Are you ready for this? Talking heads! Talking heads! Label, you know, I met this is my label and I've been running it. I started with Doc Scott many years ago, 001. And it was just a 
prototype label, which I guess it still is in that sense. I mean, he is a figurehead, you know. We have a few in the scene that are like really important key figures, and, and you know, there's Goldie and there's Blue Rider and Frosty, all these people that really hold up the whole thing and make it solid. No, there's been there since like the big, the, the big explosion, you know what I mean? It was like, all the elements in Metalheads, all the artists have been there since like day dot. Goldie, with Roy Dibber, man, has really did take the scene and the whole drum and bass thing to another level. For me, Metalheads sort of, it, it brought a lot of people together and within those sort of ranks, everyone sort of set the basic standards of how the music is today. Concepts ahead, everyone's in their head. It's just saying their heads must keep their heads, just go forward. It's not saying that Metalheads is a label, it's the most prestigious whatever. We don't blow any horns, man. It's about a lot of people that have been creative, that have been together and making it work. They've, they've done a wicked, wicked job. If you look at the back catalogue, I mean, there's very few labels that have got a back catalogue as rich as the Metalheads back catalogue, you know. really weird that the kind of symbol, I mean this guy Darren did it and it was really weird because it always reminded me of a very strong icon because it was, it was, it was literally meaning that long after I'm dead and everybody else is dead the music will still be here, which is why it's a skull with a pair of headphones on. I don't reckon there's many other labels, you know, around that, you know, you can have that kind of artistic freedom to do what you want. And there's no real bar barriers you know, holding you back from you know, taking it a step further. That's what Metalheads is about. There's so many different people involved within it, like from so many different backgrounds. We're not all coming from a, a jazz background, we're not all coming from a rock background, you know, it's all different. The thing about Metalheads, when that came along, it came at a time when there was beginning to be a little bit more of a segregation in British clubland. Somehow, I don't know what happened, but you know, rave came along and it kind of made things either sort of white or black somehow. You know what I mean? And so when I went to Speed and certain breakbeat clubs in the early days, it was the first time for some time that I was going to clubs where I was getting this mixture again, and that really meant a lot to me. Well, the Blue Note, of course, used to be um, used to be the bass clef. People were getting sick of the West End policies and all that business, and the fact that you couldn't really find a good small club in London to play intense music. So, in a way, the timing was brilliant, and and you know they set the place up, and it was a huge success. Obviously, it was there that Metalheads really kind of kicked off. Blue Knot has just finished us for three years and it's just restarted the complex. I mean, the complex was an old haunt of ours. But it's just weird. I mean, I, I've had so much fun that it's just gone like that. And three years have just been just gone. It's the way they went, they just went. It's a place that people go to listen to new tunes. It's the only regular, well, three years. And whoever's going to come, you missed it. Blue Note, school, school for drum and bass, man. It's like going to school. Yeah. You do your weekly class. You know, you go to Blue Note, you hear what the new shit is. Yeah. Who's doing what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's playing what, who's mixing up, whatever. It's, it's school, man, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not like going to a club, it's school and everybody knows that. I think that's the sort of original place where you can sort of play where you want, you know, play what you want, you know? Like DJs in there really go for it proper, you know? I mean, you, you get a, a total cross-section of people. I mean, from, from I've had people turn up and say they, they're in the country for three days, they've just come from Denmark, or, you know, hi, I'm from Copenhagen, or I'm from Iceland, or... But then you get people who are from North London, South London, West London. You also get people driven down from Watford, Manchester. So they come from everywhere. I mean, even you get people from the States who, are, who might be in town for a week and they still make it down. Yeah, so, so you know, it's kind of like a global little global family there. At clubs, hard tunes go down well and like, hard beats and hard bass lines. That's what, that's what people want. That's what they want to hear at a club. People want, I mean, yeah, people want music that's going to make them dance, it's going to make them move. It's about... As I said, creating an atmosphere. Yeah. Although some DJs, I've heard Scott come on, Doc Scott come on, and bring it right down before he drops something that's lethal, lethal. <laughs> I'll never forget that when Groove Rider plays and he tears, he, tore down, like, he tears down the whole place all the time every time he plays it. I'll never forget those moments there. Couldn't it ain't stupid, ain't no music. Yeah, I get it.
know that, they know that beat, you know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. As a DJ, you'll have certain certain things, and you you might be you'll be playing certain tunes, and you'll think in different places. You're thinking right that these guys aren't ready for this one yet, but in Blue Note they're always ready. They're always ready, and you're just dropping the new shit there definitely. When you're in the club, you know you're all in there. You know, I mean, and everyone can hear what tunes are being dropped, and like you know, if anyone's coming with any new styles, you know, everyone's gonna hear it. You know, so it's like the place to be, really. If you're gonna hear a new style and repeat, you're gonna hear it there first, I reckon, more than anywhere else, because people are more inclined to uh, experiment with their music down there rather than. A lot of people have been to Blue Note or whatever and they've heard about Metalheads and when it comes to their town, when they do a tour or something like that, everybody's there because they want to get on the, they want a piece of the action, they want it, you know, they, they want a piece of the vibe. And they know that it's going to be of a certain standard, you know, and of a certain quality. It's all about my head, you understand? My head is bad, you understand? It's the biggest and best thing going on. I think people just didn't have the confidence that, that, that these small scenes could ram out big places, you know. And of course they can, you know. We used to do it at the fridge and, and you know, you could, there's nothing better than sort of playing underground music to two, three thousand people, do you know what I mean? And I think that now that the complex has come along and you've got all those different options and all those better sound systems, you can really, you know, basically pump up hardcore music. Yeah, there's a, there's a vibe at, at the clubs, obviously, because that's where everyone meets up, you know. That's where where everyone would always be together at a club unless you there's a kind of type of meeting or you know someone said we go we go go kart racing. It's gonna be cheers and beers and a few dogs beers. Now it's about the speed right, right. now. J Magic out happens to be right. the Don driver as far as their heads are concerned. So I'm just gonna follow his black line on the track. I, I was very worried about this race before <laughs> I've got no gold if you know it's took away my weight. I lost about a pound in weight now, so that should make my advantage a little bit better. <laughs> no, that's five. Next step in the uh, Next step in the motion, I get a metal that's five. Well, you have some. If you're in any doubt as to the amount of space available to drive through, don't do it. There's plenty of time out there. Take them somewhere else. Teams, do you want to do that in here before we go next door? Who thinks they can drive? Who thinks they can drive? Come over here, man. Come here. Who's got a team, man? Okay, who's got a team? Who else has got a team? Hey! Ah! 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 Listen to the drum and the bass, take you higher Cause we come to inject it, we come to play it We come to rough it, so we come to smash it Headstrong Ten years ago I was at work like everybody else I suppose and one day came Acid House. <laughs> That's when my life changed. It wasn't until 93, 94 when I started to hear what was then called Hardcore Stroke Jungle and was changing into drum and bass and I heard a couple of tracks, one by Bookham in particular, a track called Music and what I liked about it, it was just uh, and Apollo as well, just it, they were just simple and clean tracks that just had funk in in a new way I hadn't heard before. '88, I was I was probably just about discovering the hardcore scene then. I mean, there was a there was a group over here called Spiral Tribe, travellers who used to you know raid people's fields and set up tents and sound systems, and that was the first you know my introduction to hardcore was Spiral Tribe basically in a field with loads of people off their heads on the before that I was a hip hop boy. That's all that, that powered me was hip hop. 
guess for me the big thing about drum and bass is the fact that it is to me a parallel to hip hop the fact that when hip hop started it was two turntables and, and a mic and it was the fact that it was something brand new and there was an ocean of potential because rock and roll is tired you know they keep regurgitating the old things and you just need every now and again just to close the door and to look into a wide space and go oh wow this is the potential so you start off with a planet rock and then you get a you know then you get I don't know you get a tribe called Quest and then you can get a Wu-Tang Clan you know things develop you know and with hip with drum and bass to me it's the same thing it's early days really we're just five or six years into it first originally they used to call it like bonehead music when I used to work at City Sounds they used to call me Ray Bonehead because it was so intense and then it came up with like great hardcore no it's it started off as hardcore and then after hardcore um, uh, we started calling it jungle and jungle stayed with the scene for a long time and then it went into like you know uh, uh, dark do you know what I mean and then it kind of went into jump up and drum and bass and now the new term for it is jungle stroke drum and bass I would say it's it's a music to express the times we're living in right now. I think it's just music of today, but it can be listened, you know, any time. It's like, like when Goldie called his album Timeless. It's kind of summed it up, really, hasn't it, in one, in one word. Any time, doesn't matter. I mean, we still listen to 70s music now. I mean, I see dance music, the whole scene, uh, a tra as a train journey back from the 70s and 80s. There's this, there's this one journey, and there's trains going down these tracks, and every couple of years it stops. And, and it's all one music. It's all back from funk, from, from jazz, going to electro, going to hip-hop, going to disco music, going to house music, going to rave music and every now and again one of these music springs off and creates a little scene and some of them grow massive and others stay small and have their small followers so of course drum and bass is at the front of that train at the moment <laughs> Influences we really start from people like Marvin Gaye, Herbie Hancock, Yellow Jackets, Bob James, more of a sort of jazz, funk, fusion and, and soul based background. The inspiration for me was just, just really to, I heard some things that were so different from what I'd heard before and I, that's what inspired me, do you know what I mean, rather than one person. Um, my dad used to listen to a studio on reggae, his sister was grab listening to soul, a lot of rare groove. It was for me when I was at school and I was just listening to, I was in the whole rave scene and the hip hop early scene and it was, I mean, it was difficult really because I was like 14, 15 and I couldn't get into pubs because I was too small. In terms of really getting into the music it was the whole sort of breakdance era that really kind of intensified the whole feeling. I don't know, it was just like reggae artists I was into like Dennis Brown, Frankie Paul, like you, there's just loads of them you know. Um, and then like uh, hip hop was Mantronics, a lot of the, like Big Daddy Kane and stuff like that. You know, I was, I was into that sort of stuff. Yeah, Ultra Magnetic MC is like one of my all-time favorites. I mean, from way back in the day. See, for me, my influences are from like people like The Clash and James Brown, and it's all, it's all fucked up. It's all mixed up. You know what I mean? But these are people that I've grown with. I like a lot of the '70s uh, jazz, psychedelic jazz, and funk, like funkadelic. Yeah, and Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock, all those kind of people. I wasn't really even listening. To to the vocals or anything like that. It was just the beats I was into. They like all kinds of music for all kinds of reasons. They listen to sounds, you know, they're not biased towards something. If they hear an old Annie Lennox track and there's a good vocal part, they'll use it. If they hear a bit of Sun Ra and they like that kind of weird electronic keyboard you used in 1968, they'll use it. You know, they're not kind of, oh, that's jazz, we're not going to use that. They're very open-minded musically and I think that's very important. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, as I say, that train, we've got the whole, all those carriages behind us to go through and look at and just pull out what we want. The whole the whole music moves it moves at such a such a fast pace. You know, it really does because um, evolution is such a is, a, is such a, a main ingredient of drum and bass, which is what keeps it fresh, which is what keeps it interesting. People that are into our music and you know buy our music, you know whatever they whatever they're doing around our music, 
they kind of feel the, the vibe of us as people because when we're making the music that's our soul coming out of us you know and it, it's kind of jumping out onto vinyl so you can listen to what's inside of R2 hits it's the first British music since punk which is, has got an identity really I mean if you ask anyone about drum and bass, they immediately say England or London or Bristol or wherever. So it's, it's the first music since punk to have a real, to have its home in the UK, which is something that we're proud to be involved in, really. So it's good as a movement that we can all look back in 30 years, whatever, and say we started something. In one hand, it's brilliant because you can go and do it in your bedroom, and you know the real dons will come through with their own sounds, and therefore they will be at the forefront of it. But the scene does need the four heroes to come along and to take the level to that higher point and same with Groove Rider and with Goldie and with Ronnie Size and with DJ Crust and Dylan J Vaughan so they're all waiting for the next man to kind of go one step further and that's the great thing about that scene. You've got people like uh, as you said you've got called Digital Ed Rush and all those people that are uh, and, and Dillinger that are real uh, base uh, scientists you could call them that are pushing the boundary forwards when it comes to mutating bass sounds. This is the finish, one of the finished breaks that I've, that I've been working on. He's out there on his own, man. He's got his own sounds, constant inspiration. And the thing, he never likes any of his tunes. You ask anybody and they're like, I can't understand it because he never likes any of his records. I find when I do a track, Maybe I, I, I don't put all, I don't I don't never put all my all into a track. I've, I've never, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever done that yet. Right. I, what I do is I might get like the breaks done and certain parts of the track that I really like done, and then I just fill up the rest of the track with sounds that's similar to what I want. You can hear a Dillinger tune within the first four bars. You're like, that's Carl. You just know. Is it the bass? I mean, it's his beats. It, it, before his bass even drops, you you, you, you know it's Carl. <laughs> in there right now is just a just a kick just a it's all in there right. it's in there right now you've got Carl you know what I mean he's, he's, he's knocking out some really fat tunes the things that he's doing with bass lines you understand you know he's coming with just like totally unique styles and you know he's trying you know I can't hear him you know, I mean copying anyone at all you know there's no there's no it's like he's on his own he's doing his own thing you know and it's like he's creating his own sound and he's going his own direction there's different techniques of distorting your bass you can do it live you can That's just a that's just a basic flat kick, and then like you can. There's loads of ways to do it. You can just put another, you can double it up and sort another extra bass line track on it. You get a lot of hits, and that hits, but yeah. it keeps it, it keeps it raw. Totally. When it comes in, it's like a, an atmosphere to it. And you can. There's just different ways you can do it. But that's how, that's the way I'm doing it today. Wow. There's loads of ways you can you can get that distorted sort of feel. The first time I met Delinja, he started talking to me about um, hertz and frequencies, and I was like, oh, man, this guy, this guy knows his bass. You know, he, he's into it for like serious, you know. Carl, Carl's the worst one. He's, he's got tannoys, but his tannoys go lower than my ones. And, uh, Several, <laughs> several council letters. My biggest influence is Dillinger, really. Dillinger's, Dillinger's a very powerful artist, very quiet, but very powerful artist. I mean, he's, he's whole, he's a bit of a demon, man. I mean, he's, Carl really could take any, any dance floor apart and, and has done for many, many years because Carl's that kind of guy. And the breaks are all together at the moment, but. The 
frequencies that he gets, the, the way his tunes sound totally apart from everybody else's because of the, the way he sets up the bass frequencies. He's got total understanding of what he wants to hear, you know. That's just me barking. <laughs> Human bark. Sometimes I get sample CDs, now and then, now and then, but if I can do it myself, I'll just get the mic out, I'll just make a noise with my mouth, I'll twist it up in the sample or whatever, and it just sounds like an effect. I need to get sessioners in to play what I want them to play, because sometimes you, you can't always find a sample in a certain key. I mean, you can stretch and at the end of the day, you're losing quality. You can never find exactly yeah. what you want. Whereas now I'm working on my album, I'm actually getting people in and telling them what I want to play, and just locking it all in tight. Resampling it, different drops. There's different percussion sounds. A little something. I want everybody to make rec good records so I can have more records to play. For you heads, we're abstracting it. Abstract it from the metal, hardcore design. Rolling in the we abstract it from the metal. It's literally like like surfing, like hopping on a wave, it just takes you away and you, you, it's almost like you get into a state where you can't do any wrong. Whether you feel happy, sad, or you feel aggressive, or you feel whatever, it's the, the communication of feeling in music. So therefore, we don't have to necessarily lay down, you know, verses and choruses of repeatedly saying the same thing. We can sort of make the listener use their imagination more. The irrelevant of what, what bracket you may put it in, if it's good, it will affect people in one way or another. It will touch them. Before, how it used to happen was, uh, used to have the top guys, as I said, like, uh, yeah, like uh, Goldie and uh, uh, Four Hero and Fotech and all those kind of people. They was putting out tunes that would make a lot of people in the, in the scene think, how do they do that? And then and they'd, go in their, they'd go in their bedroom at, or in their studio and try the most techniques and new things will be discovered. You create so much different sounds, so much different bass lines, you do things with breaks, you know, you, and when you put them together, you, create, you do create a, a total new sound. It's all about vibes, really. So I work a lot with Ed Rush and Fierce, and we have a little kind of group of people we work with. You know, and I think for us it's just about the vibes and the tunes always, man. This is where we do virus. This All the virus, virus stuff gets done here. And is this where you've been doing the album with Rush? Yeah, yeah. We've been kind of doing it. We haven't been telling anyone we're doing it. We've just been doing it the last six months as we go along. Today's the last sort of day we have to get a track sort of. Or maybe two tracks that no, we've got, we've got to beat <laughs> So yeah, today's the final day we have to get any sort of any new material done for the album. It's been like six months in the making, huh? Uh, Ish. About that. Maybe even a little bit more. But we sort of made it without even realising, you know, we just, just came in this room once a week and, and sort of made a track a week and now we've got a, a build up of material so <clears throat> it makes sense really to put it all out at once. This is what I call the heart of the studio, the uh, sampler, the e means sampler. <laughs> everything that's 
that's the texture man he knows you know he knows about layering the tunes and getting maybe deep you know, more of a deep texture out of it more of a, a, a wider soundscape if you like um Matt also knows about all the techniques and if I say you know that sound say sound A for example mm. I feel it should be a bit more whatever if I use a word to describe it Matt knows what I'm talking about and within two presses of a button and a little processing it's there this is so nice it's got to be so nasty Sound. Very often a tune might be in a certain way up until the last hour. Yeah, and just all and change. in the last hour it's like, wait a minute, that B line's alright, but to be honest with you, I know between us we can do something a lot better than that and and the other one's like, yeah, I know, I've been feeling the same thing as well. So very often it's even, you know, in even in the last half an hour of making the tune, that can shape the whole thing. You know, I'm school. I was into the way these ones experiment because it always be. I mean, Optical is one of the. I mean, true engineers of music. Generally, general music has been involved in a lot of different things. He's got that he focused on drum bass as his forte. I know that Matt Optical is like pretty much inundated with remixes, and he's got his own album projects. Him and Everest have got a virus project coming out, and all the twelves he does. I mean, that guy is 24/7 in the studio. <laughs> So you can get vibrato and strings and stuff. He's always looking to just push it forward and just move it into the next dimension, put it for another little effects unit and put it back into the sampler and twist it up again. <laughs> scary strings on this thing really but I like to sample other people so this is a whole album here <laughs> uh, we coming back in a minute there you go as, as time goes on and we're making the track it kind of shapes then it's a sort of uh, a, a sort of piece it together as we go along job really so this should be the track hopefully <laughs> It's all about a let off, you know. I mean, people, I think people's true character comes out in the music when you hear something like somebody could be quiet, but like not outgoing and loud spoken and that, but in their music they express themselves properly. the artist to be able to make a record tomorrow or tonight, play it out on Slate tomorrow and have it on the streets a week later, that's really important. Do it on a Friday, play it on a Saturday and you, you know, you, you see if you can gauge the reaction. That's, yeah. that's what um, Shadowboxing was. Shadowboxing was, was, was a, a night in the studio, a rough mix down track and it, and it um, came together. You make the tune and you cut it on dub and you go out that weekend and you just get instant response. I think Metalhead is the most respected uh, drum and bass uh, label by far. I think it's definitely the one that pushes back, you know, the premises and breaks new ground all the time. Distortion doesn't really matter with drum and bass, so it's always just got to be loud. It's like if it distorts a bit and that doesn't matter too much as long as it cuts through and makes people's ears bleed. <laughs> case of listening to the track making it sound you know sorting out what what eq you need i.e uh, does it need more bass more top do you need to bring the snare out do you need to make it sound grungy or whatever um get all your levels set you know just you're happy with it then once you've got all that together you're gonna cut it in there um and that's just how to drum and bass is cut one track at a time straight onto straight onto the load you know, they'll push all the machinery to, to make it distort and to make it sound this grungy sound. And um, So I suppose that is using it in the wrong way because it's like digital and it's supposed to be um, exact and pure and this, that and the other. And that's why digits were invented, I suppose, to make it more exact. And they're sort of misusing it, I guess, to make this effect. Dillinger. <laughs> 
and probably my toughest client. Because oh. when he comes in, it's like, literally, I have to cut something three times because you, you, you're pushing the lathe so much, something always goes wrong over And it's literally like I'm sitting here thinking, uh, um, the, the lathe's going to blow up. And then you're talking like between around £10,000 to get it fixed. I mean, the, the, the head blows. And Dillinger just pushes and pushes and pushes. He's like one of the most um, level conscious uh, drum and bass artists. And it's all very distorted and in your face. And it's tough to cut, but it's worth it. You know, everyone comes in and says to me, you know, when the Dillinger track comes out, you really know about it. It sort of slaps you in the face. At the end of the day, you've got to make the music that the DJ wants to play. So I think that is the most important thing that you've got tunes that are accessible to a dance floor and that have got life and have got an atmosphere and that are tunes that people want to hear, really. Lemon D and Dillinger, you know what I mean? They're wicked producers. Now, as they've got a bit older, now they're going to start to DJ, you'll see a different type of vibes. Over the last, say, three or four years, I haven't seen any DJ um, come into a, a, a division, I call it the Premier League, right? In the Premier League, you're through by the Fabio, Doc Scott, Randall, Andy C, DJ Hype, and all those, all the well-known names, yeah. The last four years, I haven't seen nobody break into them. It's like, it's like, it's closed off kind of thing. The last guy that did get into there was Andy C, Andy C, yeah. And he got in there via his tune, Long Dark Tunnel, Flew Up, Massa. A long time ago, they termed uh, everyone wants to be a DJ, everyone wants to be an MC. There, there was even, you know, tracks coming out with those lyrics in them. Um, and that is the case today, you know. A lot of people, they've got an interest in it and, they, you know, they, they, they feel that they want to express that through either MC or DJ. Just listen, being versatile is my aim or my mission. In the drum and bass scene, you've got to be original. I'm watching my sounds and playing with different methods. You better rock a couple when I'm blasting through the speakers. The thing with DJing is just knowing knowing the crowd. I mean, it might take you 20 minutes to get your feet with the crowd. You drop a few different styles, see what see what they're bouncing off more, and then you can head more in that direction. It's got to be a must. Rough and rugged, no confusion. It's got to be a must. Rough and rugged. You got your records, you hunt for your tunes, you know, and then you put them together. You go out and you play it, you put all your tunes together, and if that's the sound you like, that's what you will play. And if the crowd happens to like that, and you know, then they're still good for them at the end of the day. But the way I look at it, it's nice to put two fat tunes together. You know, if you can put two fat tunes together and create a really fat mix, you know, you really you make, a, make a big impression on the crowd. You definitely will. It's about playing music to me. I don't care who's in the audience. To get what I'm saying, it's just the fact that there's an audience is enough for me. It doesn't matter who it is. To get what I'm saying. So from there, I try to do the best that I can to make them kind of move. You know, and it's... It's a buzz for me to do that, so I'm not looking at the faces, I'm looking at the feet. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those situations, so that's how it works. It's like football, it's like tennis. Some days you have a good day and some days you have a bad day, but I think a good DJ is someone who can be consistent and no matter what they're going through or what's, you know, what turmoil is in their head at that time, they can switch off and just concentrate on the crowd and, and entertain them. When you go in the rave and you see how it is, you just feel from there, really, rather than say, I'm going to play that, I'm going to play that. When I was younger and DJing in my bedroom, I always imagined being in, like, the scenario of a club atmosphere where you've got the crowd out there and whatever you play, you can take them on whatever, like, journey they need to go on. And it's just, it's an unbelievable feeling when you catch the right vibe and everything's clicking and you just, it's almost, it's, it's like autopilot, you don't need to think about it, you look in your box and it's like, that record, that record, this mix, that, you know, it's just, it all clicks together. What is it all about? It's all about the drums and the bass. It's all about the platinum brakes. Listen to the drum and bass sound, we demonstrate. It's kind of a subconscious thing, you don't consciously know what you're going to play or where you're going to play it, but you just feel the vibe and you try not to make, like, really conscious changes, you know what I mean? Try and keep it flowing on the same vibe. Some things are planned, but, you know, 50-50, uh, man. Sometimes you just, something comes into your head and you just, yeah, say on the mic. It's from the crowd and from the DJ spinning and, you know what I mean, you just, you pick up some certain things and you just, yeah. It all, it all just depends, like, the mood you're in and what's going on and... It depends on a lot of feeling. That's what it's all about, just the feeling. That's what the DJ's all about. I mean. It's about working with the crowd. You feel what they want and you go with them. I mean, then the I think in, in any in any like style of music, if you get a set of DJs, they're 
got to they're gonna have friendly competition. If they don't, the music's gonna die. There has to be friendly competition to take the to take the public every week to that cutting edge. You know, because they have to be at that cutting edge within themselves. You know what I mean? Because if if, if Groove slips for a week, someone's gonna cut it. You know what I mean? If if Scotty slips for a week, someone's gonna cut it. So 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 they all gotta be on point. It's the bumping sound of course to break that body down. Murder heads massive, are you ready for this? Head simply great big specialist. So send it stop taking over, so check it. Check it, check it, check it, check it, check it. As soon as you drop a tune in and if the crowd starts going mad, then you know that, you know what I mean, that's a good tune. And then if you bring in another good tune, you're mixing the two together and then the whole crowd's going to be, you know what I mean, going berserk. Then, well, it's just, you know, that's an experience on its own, really, I suppose. Finally, Mo. Look at Mo, man. Mo's cool. Mo's DJ in the head, you know what I mean? He'll DJ that, is not he? And you listen to Marley and you can hear Randall as well, because Randall scored him out. Which is no different than Source Direct. Project, you know what I mean? Miles very much like that, because he gives, gives me two jokes, I have a laugh. Miles very much like that. And Bailey, man, Bailey's like the heavyweight boots. He's coming with the heavyweight boots, man. I just, I just like to mix. I don't necessarily, every now and then, it depends what mood I'm in. Sometimes I might chop, um, I might chop a tune in and out here and there, but um, it's never going to sound out of place. I try not to make it sound that way anyway. To be a DJ, really, you have to have a, a, a love of music, so the two things go hand in hand. Uh, for me personally, anyway. But um, you know, I, I would never, I would never uh, stop DJing. You know. What I like to see DJing now, I like to see a whole spectrum of the music being played, especially like on a night. You know, you have your different styles of DJs on the, on the same lineup in the same room. I'm not a strictly breakbeat or strictly, you know, one type of music. I try and join different musical fields into one, you know, interesting, enjoyable, dynamic selection and I try and basically do this sort of thing so that it isn't a, an eclectic mess because I really don't like that word and I don't really like sort of the idea of going to a club and hearing some guy playing all kinds of weird shit from different areas. I like to hear someone who can really create a story. The main objective of any DJ is to make someone dance. We're coming down to bring the bass beat range and treble We're coming down to keep it hard like metal Smash the speakers, the rock, your heads Got to keep it rocking to the sound, metal heads Bad boys win Keep eating big breakfast and get ready for it Cause when I'm pulled, when I fucking pulled when we hit the corner, you know? Very, very hot, very hot, very bumpy. Not too good for the big guys, but we're managing. We're in third place. You've already, you've already done some tactics, which he doesn't know about. Sorry, sorry, yeah? <laughs> Look at the scoreboard right about there, yeah? Right. Slug. Get your own team talk, Slug. mate. Own team talk. Get your own yeah. team oh, talk. Fucking cunt. Whenever I'm ready. Metalhead's number one. Good fuck top, yeah, good fuck top, nicely. Where is it? Go on, Jamie! Come on, Jay! Go on, Jamie! Breaking it, much damage, yes, we're taking it. Metalhead's who's number one. Seconds. And in just a few moments, we're bringing the winning sequence cars out for the lap of honor. Oh, oh well.
human days will always be like the son of Carl, he's the son of Dillinger. Because he, he, he's more of like a funky Dillinger in a sense, because he has a lighter side to him. But he's very Carl orientated in terms of the way he programs. Two years ago, it's sort of this sort of dark thing was coming because a lot of people were like, oh yeah, let's get nasty, which is cool. And uh, a lot of people sort of started to define, yeah, well, I can get nastier than you, and you know what I mean, it, which was good, but I think it, it, it's sort of, it's got a bit sort of stale at the moment for me personally, where it's like, okay, well, show what the music's about because it's not to stick to one sort of sound. Absolutely. Bring it back, it's like personally, I, I like it slower because you can get a lot more in. Whereas now it's more faster, but it's more minimalistic because you can't fit music within that boundary. It's got they've taken it to the limit where you can put you know sounds at 175, but you can't put music to 175. So that's where it's stuck at this sort of thing now. And I think they're going to find well, if we go back a few BPMs or we just stick to what we're doing and another sort of set of producers break away and do stuff a little bit slower. I think that personally it's like, you know, if, as long as uh, people start realising that you can't go too fast with the music and take it back down a bit and put music within the uh, boundaries then uh, it might start changing. But. Um, at the moment it's got to that point where they've realised we're getting faster, it's all good because like, you know, it's keeping the crowd up, but the music does become a bit too minimalistic. I remember a track um, quite a few years ago and it, it was made at what the guy who made it obviously thought is ridiculously fast and it's called something like, this track's too fast. And, um, do you know what I mean? It's obviously done as a bit of a joke, like no one's ever going to make a record this fast. And, and like, like now, obviously, it's exactly what people do all the time. If you can go back to the first tune and, like, you know, in drum and bass like four or five years ago, it's the drum and bass guys that were producing, like, filtering and stuff like that. And now you can hear it in all the tunes now, you can hear it in different music, house and whatever. And I think if they, as long as the equipment keeps progressing, I think the drum and bass thing will progress. <laughs> But there's like, I mean, I've got like about 30 different versions, so I'll keep tr drawing them in. So it all sounds organic instead of like a loop, do you know what I mean? Totally. I just use it as a template for now. Yeah. Once I get them all in, and I just change them around with different modes. Nowadays, it's progressed so much where you do need like the equipment and the technology. But back then, you just needed a simple setup, like for a grand or something. It's, it's simple, it's just basically a sampler, yeah? You go to, I'll show you my sampler. Basically, it's like you go, it's the same process, it's just you've got this hands on. So yeah. they're like sitting there and, um, sitting there and doing it there it's like you just fucking you just tweak it there the technology involved in music making now gives you so much freedom it gives you too much freedom actually it's easy once you know how you know if someone you've had to use the equipment and everything then you can find it do you understand uh, if you're someone that just he wants to get that sound straight away, you don't know what to do, you know, you're going to go and buy the equipment, you're lost. I'm able to record my horns just into the hard disk and then they come up on the screen, I can move them around, I can take bits out, I can... You can never do that on a, like on a 24 track. So it's just like a tone, so I could go to a tone, yeah? But these are all the same tones, really. It's just that someone's pre-programmed them and made shit out of it, you know? Change the waveform. Sometimes it can eat you, it can eat you up if you haven't got a social life, you've got to break away from it and you've got to do other things apart from uh, being in the studio because it can like crack you up. We've made friends with our machines, that's kind of what we've had to do, do you know what I mean? Because we haven't seen anybody, it's like yeah, you know, the machines are your friends. Anyone can go into a studio and start, you know, twiddling a load of knobs, but if it doesn't sound right on the mix down, it'll sound sort of shit out on the club, you know what I mean? It's, it's a hard job, it can actually crack you up. Who are we picking our own team? Yeah, that's what I thought you'd be the rest of us.
You fool be the rest of us. Right, West Wall, let's just go. Let's 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 go.
really is, when you make music, ultimately you make it for yourself, but it's nice to, to play it to people, man, and hear what they think and, and, and get reactions, and you know, I, I, I like that, so as far as I'm concerned, I want as many people as possible to hear my music. Drum and bass is the next level, and I think, personally, drum and bass is the music for the millennium. It's not following no commercial pattern. I mean, the, the commercial press, the commercial record labels focused on the scene for the last couple of years, and they've long moved off it onto Speed Garage, onto the next thing. But And people have even said, oh, drum and bass have died out. But that's bullshit, because the underground scene are still solid and following their roots. The majors of like, you know, I mean... Come on, you know what I mean? It's 1998, they're still doing the same old thing, and really they've got to take more notice. And what I'd like to see happen is people like, you know, Frosty, Brian, um, you know, other people taking charge, and hopefully majors coming forward and saying, well, look, hang on a minute, you know what I mean? Everyone can have a piece of the pie, but why don't we do the a in okay? And they just sell the records, because that's what they're good at. Give us the distribution worldwide, and we take care of business. Cream crackers. <laughs> oh. Again, another sparkling day at the Heads Camp. It always starts in rain, but as you can see, it always finishes in bright sunshine. 7 1, Goldie at Headsville. 7 1, good day. We've got shows on Kiss, Radio 1. So, you know, 10, ten years from now, hopefully, it would have taken over the whole planet. Just locked on, it's Radio 1, it's Groove Rider in the chair till the hour of 4. Music policy, drum and bass strictly. As I say, in 15 minutes or so, we go into the mix from Cream Fields. Musicology, Radio 1 is where you hear it first, remember that. that like we just try to stay on top of music do you know what I'm saying like we just always on the lookout for new things you know you can't get stuck in the same thing for so many years without changing do you know what I'm saying and we're like you know we'd like to change you know it's progression for us you know and that's how we work and that's how I work that's they're my rules you know always be on the lookout never be negative to anything that's new you know and that's the way you learn so now we're out to die so also to cross and not forgetting the hand poncho, Roddy Sides. I don't have a like uh, a plan or anything. You know, it's just whatever hits me at the time. Because music's a heart thing, it's not a head thing. Do you think it's really easy? Okay, I mean anyone can do it. You know, anyone can play a couple of records. Do you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you've got your dons. You've got your real heavyweights, you've got your maestros, you've got your leaders, and to me, if you ask me who the two best DJs in Great Beat, drum and bass are, the two guys who I'd run a long way to go and listen to, it would be Groove Rider or Crust. A 
at the end of the day, the Dons are the Dons, and you need them, and they inspire the Jay Magics and the Giles Petersons to go along and play a few breakbeat records and get away with it. <laughs> I just hope that, you know, one day I can switch on the radio and it's just going to be drum and bass all day long. Do you know what I mean? A lot of producers now have just got to keep their flavours. Instead of moving on to something new, we're getting the old flavours. Yeah. We're getting the techno, we're getting... You can maybe move on to another thing now, they might forget the funk. They shouldn't forget the funk. Keep with the funk, keep all flavours running, because it gets too concentrated into one flavour. I just think everyone should keep the flavours, keep all the flavours, and keep rolling out all the flavours. In the future, they can look at that and say that was as far into the future as anyone was going. To me, it's the most futuristic music going at this present moment. There's nothing else that is so advanced. You know, every, every every type of other type of music I look at it is um, very timid. If you knew what people were going to be making tomorrow, you would have made it last week. But <laughs> it's just going to progress into it's just, well, it's in its own thing already. It's established its own thing, and it will just carry on. From what I can see, drum and bass is just spreading all over the world. You know, which is another thing that shocks me. A lot of the artists are moving on to setting up other records or, or signing to bigger labels, but they keep putting out their underground tracks through a label like Metalheads, and that's so important for the music to be alive. Basically, all the overground people, they always look to the underground to see what's new, and they grab hold of that and make it overground. So, if we can establish a real underground drum and bass network in the States, then it's, it's going to cross over. It just might take 10 years. The times that they're going through now is the reward for all the times they went through then. Do you know what I mean? When they were putting in like three, four gigs a night, when guys were traveling like, yo, this part of London, that north of England, down here, over there. Yo, them, them, so they put in the work. They put in the work. So at the end of the day, they just, they just reaping the rewards of what they, they've created for themselves, really. So whether or not he stops tomorrow, I don't really give a fuck to be quite frank, because we did it all. I kind of did it all. I, don't really, I wasn't really supposed to get out of Warsaw, was I? Let's face it. I wasn't supposed to get further than the bottom of my, the bottom of the Louis Jersey Children's Home drive. But I got out. I got out of there. So anything, I don't really give a fuck what happens after tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? I could go home and die. And it doesn't really matter to me. What really matters is just that I'm not forgotten. The music is obviously is entombed, so to speak. It's already kind of scratched into the rocks. It already exists.